You're listening to Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. You saw Ryan just sitting down. That's my thing now. I got to catch you sitting down <laughs> three times in a row now. It's uh, uh, yeah, well, it's authentic. Just to make sure. You it's know. like, hey, we're just we're just going here. We're not. We, this isn't scripted. Yeah. Hey everyone, how are you today? Hello. Hey guys, thanks for listening. Um, I, I will say this because it's important, and I was told to say it because it is important. But please, if you're enjoying the show, it, it really helps. I mean, the show is free, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Unless you're an awesome patron and, and you're contributing more, which is unbelievable. But uh, if you could write a review on Apple Podcasts, that's huge. It's an algorithm thing. So write a review. Go to Al Apple Podcasts right now. Press pause. Just write a review real quick. Hopefully yeah. five stars if you if you like it. Um, and if you're here for Tom Welling and then you, you know, usually the numbers grow, jump up big. Uh -huh. But stick around. We've got a lot of great guests. And if you like this, hey. Do your old foul uh, Rosenbaum Lex Luthor a favor here. <laughs> Stick around, man. We were just in Screen Rant a few days ago. Actors with podcasts. We were ranked number five. So I saw it like, that. It was like Dax's podcast, and I think Sophia Bush, mine, uh, Oliver Hudson, and Kate Hudson. They have a show. So we were five. That that made me really happy. Yeah. I mean, you know, you shouldn't gauge happiness based on you know. Uh, we've talked about this in the show, but it's, it's nice to see that you're getting acknowledgement is not a bad thing. Five out of 10 is pretty solid. It's my average in school. What now Dax? What now? What up daddy Dax fucker? I love you. <laughs> he won't watch this ever. He's never seen it. He's never heard it. Whatever. He won't. It's fine. <laughs> I've listened to his. When you have three hours to kill. Yeah. I won't listen to three hours. Mine. That's why mine's an hour. So people can go on my way to work and then mm -hmm. on their way home from work, they could finish it. Mm hmm with with other shows like joe rogan it's like so i'm going to start this on monday and i'll end by february jesus yeah i can't do it i i love those guys great, great shows I, I assume they're huge um i just can't i can't talk that long and i, I just i'm I, I, I as whoa whoa as uninteresting or interesting as i could be or am sometimes which i don't believe i am i get uninteresting really fast if i get tired i'm like oh God, i got add uh look at that oh i have a lost boys poster yeah dude you've had it forever why are you looking at it because i'm bored that's why you're number five, man. That's why I'm number five, <laughs> and I'm not number one. Oh, if Ethan's listening, he's going, ah, oh, Ryan with the zinger, 2021 <laughs> zinger. But uh, go to Apple Podcasts, please. Uh, if you're listening there or have the app, stop what you're doing. Go support the show. It takes a couple of seconds. It really helps everything we're doing here. We also have a Stage It, Rob and I, my band Sunspin. I know if you're tired of hearing it, wait till the album comes out because I think you're going to love it. Um, the website is up, sunspin.com. And you just go on the website, merch, and you can book the band and upcoming shows, which we have one January 30th, which is the last Saturday. Can I show this month. coaster? Oh, there's a coaster. It's a sunspin coaster. Yeah. We're getting better ones, too. There's those, but we're getting, like, really cool granite ones or stone mm -hmm. ones. Um, yeah. I like it, though. I collect coasters. I like it. Yeah. Well, I guess he's asking for one. <laughs> hmm. mm. I'll have to remember that. So uh, that, uh, if you want to follow us on the sunspin handles, that's at sunspit band sunspin band on all the uh socials and what's the inside of you handles ryan they're at inside of you pod uh, on twitter <laughs> and inside, uh, inside of you podcast on instagram and facebook at inside of you podcast on uh instagram and facebook youtube.com so. slash inside of you with michael rosenbaum yes and and uh, also you could follow me on stage at stage it.com that's where the uh the shows uh sunspin the more followers i get it's great because then i could just message you and say hey we have a show and you can be alerted um and sunspin we could use a hell of a lot more followers on those blow those suckers up on the handles let's get a big following for old sunspin here just because i'm a little older doesn't mean i can't have a rock band live your dreams folks live your dreams i'm not in it to be a rock star i'm in it to What's, beat it to beat the it. ground it beats the ground you just got to do what you love. You got to do what you love. Also, uh, why don't we do this? Why don't we take 15% off at the in, uh, Inside of You online store? We got tumblers, new tumblers. We got hats and shirts and uh, awesome coffee mugs that are running out. And we got some, uh, there's some pictures, Lex Luthor pictures. Uh, we got lunch boxes now, Smallville lunch boxes. Hmm. The code is, how about Happy New Year 21 for 15% off? Happy New Year 21 for 15% off everything at the online store. A big guest today um he's tall he's like six four you guys know him he was clark Kent. he was my buddy we've become closer friends over the years we go to conventions together we do the smallville nights whenever conventions come you'll have to visit us it's a it's a great evening um and you just edited this edit edited this ryan mm -hmm. and um what was your overall feeling uh i i liked it because 
and this is your third time with Tom Welling? Third time. I try to I do did, one every year. I, I'd never, yeah, so I'd never really... Uh, Listened. Nope. Be honest. Yeah. You son of a bitch. Uh, well, it was, it was an old one. Of course. And now you can watch, you could listen, uh, all that. And, you know, what I love about this is he has a secret that he tells today and pretty, pretty early in the episode. And uh, I don't think it's out. So you're going to have to <laughs> stick around. It's pretty funny. Uh, it's pretty funny. Also, he, uh, he was in Africa, South Africa, doing a show. And boy, did that get bonkers. Uh, gunfire and shit like that. But, you know, he moved away. He's, you know, he's taking care of his wife and his uh, little man, Thompson, who I love. And uh, what well, I say, you know, mm. I said wife, Jess. I love Jess. Jess, Jess, I love you. You're uh, you're the meat and potatoes. You're you're <laughs> the without him, without her. I think he'd be effed without a good woman next to us. As where men, we, we're screwed. Where would we be? If we're single, we're, we're probably screwed, really screwed. Mm -hmm. And if we have a good uh, we don't have a good woman next to us. We could be even more screwed. In other words, you have to have a solid foundation. Yep. Which I don't know the answer. I don't know how to find that. Why don't we just say hell with it and let's get inside of Tom Welling. It's my point of view. You're listening to Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. Inside of you with Michael Rosenbaum was not recorded in front of a live studio audience. First of all, I don't know what's happened with it. You know, uh, happy new year, by the way. Oh, yeah. Happy new year. Yeah. Happy new year, bud. Forgot about that. You forgot about the new year, huh? Well, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of people listening or watching this that it's tough to know what day it is sometimes <laughs> during all this. It is, man. It is. You know, there's really no like Mondays or Fridays or Saturdays. I mean. I'm really happy the football came back because at least I know what day it is because there's football on TV. It's Who do you root for? Day. It's one of four days if you're watching football. So. Who do you root for? Anybody. I root for them all. I root for everybody. Good like, for I don't you. really have a team. I just like good games. Um, there was a game that I watched recently. I think it was the Browns and the Ravens. Yeah. And, and it was like, it was like, I don't know, three touchdowns and a field goal to win the game in the last two minutes. It was like, that was one of the best games. See, that's fun. That's fun to watch. You know, during this whole time, you know, with the COVID thing and all the shit that's going on, you know, I had, like everybody has their bad stuff. You know, my mom got COVID. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, she got okay. COVID. Uh, yeah, she's doing all right. Thank God. Uh, it was a little bit, you know, because my mom's, you know, I'm, I could be a hypochondriac, a hypochondriac sometimes. But, you know, my mother, it's just like, Michael, I'm going to get a mammogram. I've talked about that. And she's like, I'm like, okay, that's what women do. I know, but uh, what if I have cancer? I'm like, well, they'll treat it. I don't, this is, you know, and I'm giving her advice and I, I don't take my own advice when I kind of like freak out about something. And they're like, well, that hasn't happened. Why are you worried about something that hasn't happened? But that's a story of my life. Do you do, you do that? Well, do you I mean, I, I think that, you know, in the time that I've known you, there's, there's, there's gotta be some trickle down. <laughs> emotionality there from the mother like, everything comes from the mother i mean it's, mothers are very important um i see that in my own life with my own child um but you know i i can see where what what like. what are you talking about what are you referring to i want you to analyze me what is it that you see that might have as you call it trickled down from my mother i mean i think you're a very well adjusted you're one of the kindest person kindest people i know um I mean, as 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 ADD and nuts as you can be at times, you're like the nicest person in the world. Like I know some other people who who get all amped up in ADD and they're just like rude. And you're not. You're kind. You're a very kind person. You're in your soul. And I'm at least you have that. Uh, but uh, the hypochondriac, <laughs> that whole thing. I mean, that's got to come from your mom a little bit, based on sure. the story you told. Yeah. I mean, you know. I mean, I I don't know if you have anxiety. <laughs> Yeah, you know I have anxiety. I had, you know, sometimes we were at those conventions. I was having a bad time with anxiety, and uh, there were a couple of times where we're taking pictures, and sometimes those long, lines are long with hundreds of people, and I'm wondering how many we have left. I keep asking JP, your yeah. guy, or whatever, or you know, how many we have left because I'm like I, I gotta. I remember just like I, I I I didn't tell you, but I was I was having bad anxiety. Did you notice, or you, I covered it? No, I do remember you always being like, um, okay, how many left? How many left? How many left? And not in a bad way, uh, but just being, I didn't realize that you were 
sort of trying to sort out your own pace. Um, I just thought you were trying to keep track of how many people were going through, to be honest. But, um, you know, it's the ups and downs. That, the conventions are really strangely amazing. And, I mean, I only go, I, you know, you brought me into them, and um, I found a way to really, like, enjoy them and enjoy the fans. And the, But the flip side is you're on, like, the whole time, and I'm not trying to complain, anybody out there. But you want to be there for every single person who's there for you. Absolutely, yeah. And it's it's a lot of energy. And and at the end of the day, it's great. When you look at the lines and everything else and you want to be there for those people, I can see where the anxiety might creep up about how you're going to be able to yeah. be there for Yeah, but it's not really my – I don't think my anxiety was – it wasn't from the people like I was uh, nervous to meet them. I just go in these waves where – I'm absolutely elated and no no anxiety and just confident and want to make people laugh. But there was a time period and I you know and those scare you when you get anxiety. I don't know if you've dealt with it, but when you go through a period in time where you're you you're in, anything triggers anxiety and you're like am I going to be too tired? Am I going to be this? Or am I not going to be enough? I don't know what it was, but there was a time period where I just I couldn't even pl- place where it was coming from. Do you really? get do you do, you know, I notice you you get cuz you're like I'm here, I'm safe. I'm in a completely right. safe environment. I'm in con- completely control of the time and, and 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 like the ratio of you're in complete control, yet you still have anxiety, which that's a different anxiety. I've had anxiety when I when I've realized I'm not prepared for a situation oh, yeah. and then I get anxiety. Maybe that's nerves, whatever. What happens to you? Oh, you just yeah, you know, I mean, there's there's only been a couple of times that I've that I feel like it's really gotten me, but it's like it's just like you're outside of your own head back here. Um, and you just, you're just out of it. Like you're just, you're not where you want to be. And then that creates more anxiety. And then it just like, it compounds. Yeah, you're hyper aware of, of all these, these, these negative things. You're ruminating on all these negative things, which now t- appear to be real, but they're really not, but you're right. making them feel real. Right. Yeah. But the, the circumstances I'm talking about were what I was not in control of the environment. Um, whereas like what you're talking about is interesting to me because, you know, in that convention space, you're complete control yet the anxiety still crept in. Um, you know, exactly. But I think for me, it's always like my whole life, I'm anxious to make people, you know, like me happy with me. I want to make you feel like, okay, Rosenbaum's always going to make me laugh. He's going to, the energy is going to be good. We're going to get through the day. It's going to be more fun with him around. And I, I feel like I, I I, I want to make you uh, enjoy yourself. When when I've all, never felt that way. Well, exactly. But I'm saying I I've think there's never a, there's felt a enjoyment. well. I think <laughs> I've never felt enjoyment with you. It's no, never what, I'm, what, what I'm saying is that I think that that I always want. I'm a people pleaser. I want to make everybody happy. I want to like. I want to. I always was like the fence, you know, the guy in the middle. It was. I was watching the Bee Gees documentary, which you should watch. You'll love it. It just came I, out. No, I just heard about this. It's very fantastic. fantastic. But Maurice was the middle gib. He was mid gib. And there were Robin Gibb and Barry Gibb on his brothers, and and you know they fought because they were the best singers in the band. You know, Ro- Robin was the guy, or Barry was like, like I'm waiting for this moment to last. You know, and he would get the high, and the other, but but together they were uh, enormous. But they used to fight. I I want to be I want to be the leader. I want to be the leader. And Maurice was the guy in the middle. And so I'm like, no, 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 he loves you. It's your brother. He, no, 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 that's not what he meant. So I was always like that as a kid with my family. You know, your sister's a goddamn, no, 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 she's your daughter. You're the peacekeeper. Peacekeeper, and that is exhausting. Oh, yeah. I don't think you ever were. You, like, I envy you because in a lot of ways you, uh, I don't know if you were innately born a leader. I mean, look, you, you, you've got flaws. You, like, I know that you can be short-tempered sometime. You have, you're impatient like me. We could what? Be, well, what do you? <laughs> you know, and that's and you're working on that. Jess is a great wife because she also calls you out on it, and you're like, oh, oh well, I, sure. yeah, she's very quite grounding. Yeah, yeah. Does she does she ever say like Tom? Because like I, obviously I've seen therapy. I, I know every actor. I think I've said. Does she ever say Tom? Maybe you should see someone. Yeah, she has. Yes, she has. <laughs> and what did you do? Did you see someone? Well, there's there's someone that her and I both talked to, not at the same time, and it's been very helpful. And he actually brought the Bee Gees documentary with a different point of. He said it was, I should watch it. It's interesting because there's this thing in psychology where you can never be creative if you're being, um, you can never be in the creative mode when you're in the survival mode. 
And he referenced the Bee Gees documentary because as they grew to fame in the uh, disco era, and that went out of fashion very quickly, apparently. They, they rose to fame and it went out. Of... Then they were in survival mode, and they apparently, I haven't seen it, but apparently they sort of regrouped, and they realized they could write this music um, in a different style. And because of the falsetto that they use, and it was a male-dominated disco era, and as they came out of that, the falsetto was actually more of a, the, what they wrote lended more toward the female voice. And they wrote a lot of music for a lot of Dionne people. Dionne Warwick, Barbara Streisand. Yes, exactly. Yeah. But you just said something that I think is incredibly valuable. And I haven't heard it on the podcast. And maybe uh, it's so simple, but you said you can't be creative when you're in survival mode. Yeah. I, this is something that's been resonating with me in the last few months since I've heard it and it's been explained to me. And especially, you know, listen, you, you can't talk to anybody for more than five seconds without the COVID thing. Right. And it's hard and, and it's different and we're going to get through it. Um, but what it does, is it puts you in survival mode. And what we have to strive for is to remain in creative mode. And you and I, you and I, you know, we talk all, all the time about like, wait, what can we do? How can we be creative? And you're very self-motivating in that way of like, what can we do? What, we, what can we create? Because the flip side of that is despair and feeling sorry for yourself and or making wrong decisions based on maybe what is now but won't be in the future. So I'm rambling a little bit. No, but, yeah, I like this. You can't be creative when you're trying to survive. So, so from your therapy, you know, back to that, like he's you're like, hey, you know, I could be impatient, I could be this and like this. So what does he do? Kind of kind of talk talk to you about where it's coming from and how you can uh what, what does he tell you to do to help that? Because I because well, I want it's, it's an that. interesting thing. It's the guy that we that we talked to, he it's not necessarily about it's it, it, it it's hard to explain, and I don't know if this is gonna be worthwhile, you know, for you in, in this podcast, but it's more about the idea of where things might come from. It's more of discussional. Um, and it's just about what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And it could be this. But he has really narrowed down the idea for me, which I touched on earlier with you, is like the mother is very important. And a lot of times when whoever we are, when we go into the self-discovery realm, it's, you know, the more you know about your mother, the more you can understand about yourself, because there's a good number of years there where you were, you were, you were impressed certain values and certain ideas and certain energies and certain um, passions and how you were treated before you ever had a chance to walk or talk. And, you know, it's as an adult, the, the idea is you grow up and you, you, you're able to acknowledge that and and make your own decisions and treat your life your own way. So, um, you know, I mean, you're, you're a very well-rounded person as far as I'm concerned. Mm. And, and you see those things. I mean, going back to what, like your mother looks for you for guidance in a way. And, yeah. Know. But like, you know, you say the trickle down thing. I'm curious as to what trickled down from your mother or father, but I'm also curious, like, you know, um, for me, I think I'm very good at making people feel like I have my shit together and I'm creative and I'm always confident. I'm always this. And what this podcast has done for me is it's allowed me to express insecurities and vulnerabilities that I normally wouldn't discuss with most people. And it also, in a way, <laughs> it makes me feel like everything's okay. Like, you know what? You can go do this and you could fail and people are going to still love you. You can go do this and you can take a chance and it's going to be okay. You're not... It's almost like these little things that if you talk about them enough, then they almost get dissolved in a way. They almost dissolve when you have people out there listening, going, I get that. I get being, you know, you know, I'm just trying to survive. And well, I'm not at my best when I'm trying to survive. So well, what am I trying? You just, you just literally use the word survive. And listen, I'm not the all knowing thing about this, but um, when you're trying to survive, it's a lonely journey. Mm -hmm. And what you're talking about, what I hear from you when I listen to your podcast is the joy that I get out of listening is it makes me feel a little less alone, if that makes any sense, because other exactly. people experience the same thing. And that's the survival creative thing. I mean, I read this thing about Kristen Bell the other day, which I know has been on your podcast. She's like, listen, it, you know, I just got to a point where I wanted to be genuine and express these things. And she's found a way to 
get closer to herself and to the people around her by being genuine and exposing vulnerabilities because we all have them. There's there's just this pretext of like we're supposed to be perfect because, you know, if if you're looking to media as an example, you, well, you're gonna always be disappointed because that's what media is trying to do is just show you the best or worst. Right. Somebody who I wanted to talk about today, real quick. Um, I don't know if you've seen the Matthew McConaughey book, Green Lights. No. I don't know him, but I I read the book and it's you should have him on your podcast because he, he's, he's amazing. I'm gonna call him. I'm gonna call him Matt. Based on journals he's had for since he was I don't know 20. Is it called All Right, All Right, All Right? No, but he says that a little bit. But it's called Green Lights. <laughs> okay. And it's about making choice. There's green lights, yellow lights, and red lights, and you try to create more green lights for yourself. Um, Hmm. But the idea of you're just trying to like create opportunities for yourself and bring people in as opposed to keeping people out. But one of the things when you talk about your anxiety and the people that I've seen speak to you is it makes me feel less alone. It's, and especially these days where everybody feels isolated, we all felt isolated before in our own heads in a sense. So. Well, you know, I think of you as someone who, again, I, I'm just not that guy. But when I feel like, you know, Tom doesn't need anything. Tom doesn't need anyone. He needs, he has his wife and he has his child. But before that, Tom just, either you didn't let anybody into that because you are a private guy. And I appreciate you always to open up whatever you want to open up. And, you know, I'm always uh, happy when you just talk to me. <laughs> but ultimately, you know, you hold a lot in, I'm sure. But you go, you know, you're kind of like you do something, you go home, you don't need anybody. You don't need to be around a lot of people. And do you get lonely? Do you feel sometimes lonely, even though you have a kid or child? Do you ever feel like I'm a, I'm still alone in a way sometimes? I think there's been times, I think like when we were doing Smallville, there was a lot of loneliness because I didn't know how to navigate that. And maybe I kind of kept everybody away because I just, I wanted to be alone because one, I didn't have any time alone during those years. And your ex wasn't that supportive, not to bring her up. I, don't, I mean, like... <laughs> I don't I don't know how you go further than non-supportive, whatever that word is. I okay. noticed that. I just always remember like, yeah. you know, a woman or a man needs to they just need to support each other. And I like I mean, if you're if you're in a relationship, you want support. And if you're single, I mean, like you are, you have a you have a great support system around you with your friends and mm -hmm. your family, but support is very important. Yes. Um but I listen, I'm I'm I mean I don't mind being by myself. I, I mean, everybody needs time to themselves. Um, as you know, I just moved ah. and got some more space up in Northern California. And at least for an hour a day, I go outside and I'm up in the hills and the mountains and by myself. And that's, it's like a, I don't see it as an act of meditation, but it probably is. It just gets me out. Yeah. It's the same thing. Um, but, you know, my, my, glorious wife and my and my hilarious son definitely helped me not feeling like lonely of course yeah um so that i mean i i i, I only wish that you could find what i have when that, you that's decide. hard well you know by the way i know congrats on the the you know you got a kid another kid on the way what what you have another kid on the way i no I yeah Dude, I talked to Jess. I, I'm, I, sh I thought you... Are you serious? Yes! Inside of You is brought to you by Echelon. Guys, you know I have all this stuff in my house. I don't leave the house, especially during crazy times, whacked out times like this. Seriously. I can, Ryan, I could just go down on my rower. I can go on my bike. You're going to go down on your rower? I can go down on my rower. Okay. I could go downstairs and I could hit the rower. I can go on my stationary bike. I could hit the mirror, which shows me to stretch correctly. I could take a boxing course. Echelon's affordable. I love the service. I had a problem with something. It was my own damn fault. I figured it out. But... I called them and they had someone call me back. It was like a Saturday night. I don't know if they'll do that for you, maybe because I'm a celebrity. <laughs> but I'm just saying, <laughs> Echelon really is. Uh, no, they, they are fantastic. And uh, they're offering the next generation of connected fitness bikes, fitness mirrors, rowing machines, and their Echelon Stride Smart Treadmill. No matter what your favorite fitness activity, Echelon gives you a fun and challenging workout from the comfort of your own home. The EX7S is Echelon's latest state-of-the-art innovation that takes cycling to the very next level. The EX7S connected bike is built with performance, flexibility, and durability in mind. The EX7S is the bike for competitors at heart. 
And unlike their competitors, which I've said, Echelon is affordable for everyone. And one membership, just one, lets up to five family members all work out at the same time. And right now, you guys can try Echelon Fitness Equipment at home for 30 days. You're going to love it because I'm telling you, and uh, I, I've never had one complaint from people saying, oh, you said that and this sucked. <laughs> I'm telling you, this stuff's great and it's cheaper. So if you're looking to exercise and get your life in order for the new year, these are the guys, man, Echelon. Go to echelonfit.com slash inside of you. That's E-C-H-E-L-O-N fit.com slash inside of you. Inside of you is brought to you by PetSmart. If you have a pet, you got to use PetSmart. You know, Ryan, how we have like DoorDash or things and we get things delivered to mm -hmm. us. Well, doesn't your pet deserve the same thing? Yeah. And, and the thing is, you don't even have to say your pet. You deserve it because it's easier for you because they don't pay for their own crap. You pay for it. Exactly. So why wouldn't you want to order something and not have to get out of your off your butt? and drive somewhere to pick it up. You can have it delivered or you go there. I mean, it's just a pet smart is freaking smart. And that's all I want to say about that. From the beginning of the pandemic, pet smart has been an essential retailer, making sure you can get everything your pet needs right when you need it at over 1600 convenient locations. And what I like about pet smart stores, Ryan, you know what I like clean, yeah. safe. They, they follow protocol, you know, and I think that's really important. Disinfecting protocols, face coverings or masks are required for employees and pet parents. I think that's really great. Stores and grooming salons offer digital check-in, curbside drop-off, and pickup and contactless payment. PetSmart now has responded to the unprecedented demand for contactless shopping by adding curbside pickup for website or app orders. And now PetSmart offers free same-day delivery powered by DoorDash through January 31st, 2021. So you can get everything your, your pet needs. Don't forget, free same-day delivery powered by DoorDash. Offer expires January 31st. Get in on that. Check out PetSmart.com for more details. That's PetSmart.com for more details. PetSmart.com. She told you. <laughs> yeah, she told me. You lied. <laughs> Bastard. Oh, but you do. You have another one coming. You, you got little Thompson. He's the yeah. cutest little. You know, there's nothing more infuriating than when beautiful people have beautiful children. I'm telling you, like... <laughs> We, you, you and I FaceTime last week and Thompson started talking to me, but, and I was like, this is what happens. Uh, you know, your friends who have kids. Cause I kept just putting Thompson on the FaceTime with you over and over. I know. Thank you. you. Seemed to love it. Same mentality level. It's good. But I found myself being like, Hey man, I know I'm biased, but this kid's cute. But you know what? He is. Like, he he's is. Really, he's a good, cute, funny kid. He makes me laugh all the time. What trickled down from your mom and dad? Because I, I think you, uh, I want to know what you what you think trickle down, good or bad. Um, as you know, I'm I'm a little private, so I, I wouldn't necessarily just like talk to you as if I was talking to like. <laughs> right, right, but but there there are things. Um, you can't help it a little bit of. I think my my work ethic definitely like almost to a fault where um, I have a tendency to want more information about like say a project more information than maybe people want to give me before I agree. But that's because when I agree or I sign a contract, I am like, so in like it's, there's no out. So that's a good thing that trickled down then. It is, but I've had to temper that a little bit because people are like, dude, you have to get the job before you ask those questions. And I'm like, well, I don't want the job until I know these questions or blah, blah, blah. So I've had to like be a little more savvy politically about how to get that stuff. Right. Um, but I think, you know, there's a good naturedness, there's a Midwesternness that mm -hmm. you and I share and whatnot. But there's also, you know, my, you know, I've come to realize, and I, and I don't mean this in a bad way or not, but I get to spend so much time with my family and my son right now, based on the fact that I'm not on set and, and the COVID had shut things down. And like my parents never had that opportunity. My mother raised four kids while my dad went to work like every day all the time. And, you know, I'd see him on the weekends. And to me, that was normal. Now I'm looking back and there's a little bit like, oh, I, maybe I was missing my dad a little bit and I didn't realize it because it was just normal, you know? And huh. I see that now as I look at my own son and where I want to be for him because when hopefully I do go back to work, as you know, it's three months, six months, a right. year of limited access to your family. You know, even when you do come home from work, it's, you're exhausted and you're, you know, there's no like, it's hard to juggle. So I'm really enjoying this time that I have of just like 
spending time with my family right now because I think things are going to really pick up. Oh yeah. You know, once everyone feels safe enough to do so. So subconsciously you resent your father. That's I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I mean, you know, the, the whole thing, <laughs> a couple months ago, the whole Tom Cruise thing about when he, when he lost his, lost his, his school on the yeah. set of Mr. Possible. And you know, George Clooney said something where he was like, I don't have all the information, but maybe it's not the first time that Tom's had to deal with that. And Tom's argument is like, hey, guys, we've been allowed to shoot under these certain circumstances, but we have to follow these rigid protocols. And if we don't, we're out of business. And a lot of people following our lead are going to be in trouble. So, you know, that's what it's going to be going forward. Now, do you have to yell at people? I don't know. I wasn't there. But, you know, that kind of stuff is, is going to continue. Yeah, I, I hear that. I mean, look, you get a little bit uncomfortable on set. Some things happen. There's this, you know, I don't I, I didn't actually hear Tom Cruise yell, but like I can never lose my shit on somebody for that long as Christian Bale did. I mean, it would be more like, dude, shut the fuck up. Oh, my God, Carl. I usually know all the guys names. So it's kind of a joking way. Like, you know, I'd be like, what the f J.D.? And Dude, Russell, I, I can barely remember my lines and you're fucking eating like a fucking cow. Shut the fuck up. You know, if that got recorded, people might go, oh my God, he was a bit of an ass. No, I'm kidding, but I'm not. And nobody sees Russ or JD on the other side of that laughing, being like, my bad. By the way, you know, our good buddy Russ from Smallville, who I love dearly, big bearded guy, lovable every morning. Russ, Michael, how are you? I give him a big hug. He goes, all right. And he just passed away, and um, my shout out, you know, he passed away a little while ago, but my heart goes out to his family, and I cried when he died. I just, they, he was just a family member to me. I just remember seeing him every day. So again, when you're on set for as long as we are, you, you, it, they are family. And, uh, and I know you remember him, and it, you just, as you get older, people, it's just life. It's just they start dying. You hear about it, and there's certain people that affect you, and when you're on, on set as long as we were, you yeah. know, like, honestly, like, God forbid something happened to Natalie, who was our makeup artist forever. I, I would lose my shit, I, I, you know? Well, and, and it's funny because as, as, I don't want to say analyze, but as you look at it, there's certain people that I think fit different roles for me. Like, Russ was a very grounding, yeah, he was a big guy. And, he, you know, but he was grounding. Like, when you saw Russ, you felt safe. Like he, he was, did. You know what I mean? He was going to take care of you. He was going to take care of you, whatever you need, you know, that kind of thing. And, you know, when you saw Natalie, you were, you know, maybe your depression lifted a little bit because of her light, you know, and every, you know, we had a really good, and JD, who was our camera operator, who just kept everything fun, but, but like, was like the best camera operator in the world. Oh, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. Came on set and like, just did his job, just did his job and was friendly and, I'd see him fuck up the smoke machine and just smoke everywhere, and he's wafting it everywhere. And the thing goes, I go, Russ, what happened? He goes, Well, I have a goddamn motor on this thing. I'm like, I don't know. Well, <laughs> it, it, he was in a funny situation where um, his job was the smoke. Everybody on set hated the smoke. <laughs> Everybody, you were like, No smoke. So <laughs> like, he was like, I, This is my job. I go, Russ, do we have to have a smoke? He goes, not my call, Michael. Uh, not my call. <laughs> you know. Uh, uh, he, he also got in charge at times in the Fortress of Solitude for the for the snow that would, my jazz hands, would, would trickle down in the Fortress. You weren't in the Fortress that much, but, and it was the same thing. It was like, do we need this? And I'd look at Russ and he'd be like, it's my job. <laughs> Like, there were times on that set. Do you remember the caves? Oh, those were the worst. Dude, the cave. Oh, I just saw your face change. You look pissed. They had these caves in the Smallville set where, and, and you know, Tom, you know, you were going to reminisce about no, Smallville. I can smell them right it's now. It's like that, that it was not even smoke. It was like the dust and the Lust. shit. I remember having worked in the caves before you ever saw them. And they, they put like wood chips on the ground too. So like the caves, the smoke. It was like humid. It didn't smell good. And then your your feet slipped around as you walked. And I I have a vague memory of like <laughs> you walking in a set and being like, really? You've been in here? This is what you've been doing? Like in here? What you, what? But it was exactly what Lex would have thought too. So it was like perfect. You know, you always tell these stories and, you know, maybe people have heard them before, but 
uh, they always make me laugh when, you know, for instance, I, I didn't always know what was going on. And I, I kind of like thought, you know, cause I remember this thing with Christopher Walk and he says, I don't read scripts because you're going to find out what happens when you watch the movie. And so we always played around with that. You read the scripts inside out. But like me, I remember you tell the story about me walking on set because there was a character Zod who was part of the uh, you know what? Tell the uh, yeah. Tell the Zod story. I love hearing this. Well, the Zod story, I mean, that didn't take place in the caves, but we were outside. and <laughs> oh, It still makes me laugh. There was this, so there, there's two Zod stories. One is that you'd come to me a week before we started and you were like, dude, dude, because you had, you had, you did this thing where you would come to me and maybe to other cast members and you would want to run lines for what was going to happen the next week. You were, you wanted to get ahead of it because you had a lot of lines. I didn't have a lot of lines, but I had a lot of hours that I was there. That was like the, oh, yeah, the yeah, yeah. trade off. And you'd want to run lines sometimes and I'd be like, oh my God, dude, I can't even think about next week. I'm just trying to get through today and we'd run them and you'd already be off book and you'd be completely prepared. And that was just the process. Um, and it ultimately helped me anyway, because then it got me thinking about whatever. But um, you came up to me one time and you're like, dude, dude, check this out. They want me to play another character. And I was like, yeah, I mean, all right, whatever. He was, yeah, his name's like Zod or something. I'm like, who's that? And you're like, I don't know. Do you know? I'm like, I have no idea who that is. <laughs> he could, we were like, we couldn't have been less informed as to, for our characters. And uh, and you're like, yeah, dude, I'm playing Lex in the same episode. You know what that means? And I'm like, uh, no, what it was, I mean, he goes, they got to play me twice. And I was like, they got to pay me twice. Yeah, I'm not sure it works that way. And you're like, fuck, yeah. You're like, <laughs> guess what? People that didn't work that way. Yeah, all of a sudden, I thought, you know, because it was a big part. I'm like, I'm playing this guy too. So you, you're paying me twice. So like, no, you're playing this character. Lex becomes Zod. Well, that sucks. I got I remember you just laughing. I remember doing one time. This is what these assholes on Smallville did. They had me dress up as the president and tried to make me learn 15 pages of dialogue to give a speech, which they, so I'm on there on the podium and I'm like, I was directing that episode. Right. And I go, where are the, uh, I didn't memorize. Oh, no, no, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me interject. Let me interject. interject. Let me tell the story. Because it's much better from my perspective. Jesus. So it's me and it's Glenn, Glenn Winter. And if anybody knows anything about Smallville or Arrow or anything else, you should know who Glenn Winter is. Uh, but, DP. And, and many other said. things. So he's he's DPing and I'm, I'm directing. And, and we set up this stage where, you know, Lex's president comes out and looks across everybody as the president does wearing the glove, the black glove, the white suit. Yep. And you know, we hadn't given much thought to it because you were never that person that we were worried about being prepared or unprepared. Like we just, it was never a concern that you were unprepared. Like it never even entered my mind ever. And so we come up for the blocking and you walk out on the podium. The blocking is just like when you, everybody hits their marks, so you get the lights right. And then everybody kind of goes away for five, 10 minutes. And then, then you know the next stage is we we roll camera so you come out for the blocking and i'm and you're like i'm not going to run the dialogue there's so much dialogue i'm not going to run it and we're like okay and you're only standing there so i'm like glenn you good and he's like yeah he's lit good he's good all right cool couple of tweaks couple adjustments you know and you're like how much time till we shoot glenn was like i don't know five minutes ten minutes okay right, so you leave so then you're like i don't want to do a rehearsal i just want to shoot and you were like very like, I don't know if you had a flight to catch or whatever, but it was like, it was this buildup of like, you were ready. And I'm like, wow, all right. I mean, that's like 12, 15 pages of dialogue. And he just wants to go right in it. Like, damn, all right, cool. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> so mm. you're like, I don't want to do rehearsals. Just roll cameras. I'm going to come out. So we're like, fine. So we're ready. You're behind the screen. And they go. And so I'm like, Glenn, you got, yeah. So we go action. And you walk out of the podium. I mean, there's 150 people in the cast and everybody, you know, waiting for you to come out. You walk up to the podium and you get there and you look around and you're like, where are the teleprompters? <laughs> and we were like, wait, cut, what? <laughs> and you're like, where are the teleprompters? We're like, we don't have any teleprompters. He's like, 
There's 12 pages of dialogue. I'm the president of the United States. I would have a teleprompter. Where's the teleprompter? <laughs> we, we don't have to I'm not learning 12 pages of dialogue. Oh, my gosh. But, so, then, but Tom was like, he's, he's actually right. A, a president would read off a teleprompter. And I didn't learn the line. So what happened? We cut the scene, right? No, no, no. What happened was, oh my in my recollection, is you're like, give me 15, 20 minutes. And you went away and you came back and you had it. Um, that's how I remember. It. Uh, yeah, I remember. But I remember it got cut. The scene got cut or something. Well, yeah, because it wasn't very good. Yeah, it wasn't a very good scene. I should have memorized it. Hey, you but know that's what? One of those funny things, anyway. I got abandonment issues because you move during this whole COVID thing. My friend Sean Spencer moved. My friend John Heater moved. My move, my friend Chris Dowling moved. Everybody's moved. And I'm like, fa. Like I I can't ride my scooter up to your house anymore. I can't like, you know, you're like 10 hour, whatever. Where the hell are you? You're far away. So it's now you live in this place. You're you're again, you're you got this little ranch. You just bought horses. It sounds like you're not abandoned. It's not. That's yeah, not I like, know. You, you, it sounds be, like jealousy. Maybe it's jealousy. But you have two horses now, too? You have these, what are they called? Well, they're miniature horses. It's uh, Diana and Harry. Well, Diana and Harriet, but Diana and Harry. And you have enough space. You have stables. Yeah, we basically, um, you know, th this COVID thing, um, I don't know if you and I have talked about this before, but it kind of put a lot of pressure on some friends and myself where I always knew that LA wasn't going to be the end all and be all for me. And and when this all hit, it kind of was just like, what are we doing here? Like, why don't we really think about the next stage that we were going to be looking for anyway? So it, it sort of moved everything up for us five or 10 years. So we found a ranch up in Northern California that pretty much was better than even what we were looking for. Um, and really just gave us a lot of space for us as a family, especially for my son. And to build and, and grow. And, you know, the miniature horses are funny. And I mean, they're hilarious. Um, and it's just, I, I, I feel very thankful to, to be in a, in, a, in a place with so much space because living up the street from you, we just, there wasn't enough space for us. And in Los Angeles, you can't go anywhere anyway. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, you, listen, you're, I wouldn't call you a hermit, but I mean, you, you spent a lot of time at your house. Yeah. But even when you want to leave now, there's nowhere to go. No, I don't really leave the house much. It's true. I, I, well, you're I come up here. I, I'm going to come up there. I, really, you know, I told you I'm going to come up. I'm going to come up. I almost tried to blackmail you and said I wouldn't come on your podcast unless you did it live here. I should have. <laughs> you know what? I'm going to do that next time. We're going to do it next time. Hey, look, uh, I saw the uh, trailer for this movie, this TV show you did for, uh, called Professionals. Oh yeah. And uh, and and I saw it and I was like, it looked like the production value was huge. And I remember you going to do this and I, and I see it and it's one of those things where I've been on stuff that all of a sudden they hold it for six months and then nothing happens with it. Then I've done stuff and all of a sudden they do air it. Like what's going on with it? Do you, do you even know what's happening with it? Cause it looked cool as shit. Yeah, it was crazy. We went down to South Africa for three months and we shot and it was a, it was a very uh, adventurous shoot, um, but a very exotic thing. It, you know, for me, it was, it was supposed to be a, uh, like an A team slash Ocean's Eleven sort of idea. Um, it was all daylight. It rained for one hour and three months in Johannesburg. That is all blue skies. Like that's just the season there, which is the exact opposite of, of what Vancouver is, <laughs> if you think about it. But um, it was a very adventurous, crazy, dangerous shoot. Yeah, you got shot at, right? Well, I didn't, but one of our cars did. Uh, another cast member got carjacked, and I, and I listen. I don't want to go and say that Johannesburg is is. I mean, it, it's not a safe place. But some of the people that we worked with who were from Johannesburg, it's just the norm for them. But uh, one of the um, one of the wardrobe people's uh, their car got shot with an AK forty seven. Like cross All right, wait, wait, wait. Well, what day was this in the shoot? Was this day three? Because day four, I would have been on a plane. No, this was probably <laughs> four weeks in. But every day, I had I had three security guards, and they're not just like security guards in suit. These guys are like military guys with gun with machine guns. And I had three guys with me at all times. Did you feel safe with them? I mean, I felt safe with them. Uh, I would leave the hotel and I would get into an armored vehicle that had a trail vehicle that was armored. So there were two guys with me and one guy in the back one. And the idea they told me is, I go, what if we get pulled over? Or what if we get in an accident? Because I was like curious about 
this this lifestyle and how they handle it yeah and they're like basically if we get an accident one of us would put you in the trail car and they would take you to the hospital we're not waiting for the ambulance like it was like because you don't know if you're getting carjacked you know it was very i mean it sounds like a movie on its own it was scary and the idea was for jessica and thompson to come down there (laughs) once i got settled and it really was just like uh it wasn't safe, so I, you know, they didn't come down. But you're right; the behind the scenes would have been a little even more exciting. And Brendan Fraser, who, who's you know the co-star, he got carjacked uh, while we were down there. I don't what? Know if you want to say that. Yeah, they just and they just wanted his cell phone, nothing else. Was he nervous? Was he? Um, he was a little shaken up the next day as we talked about it. I think what happened, you know, you go to these places and. You you know you're excited and you're filming and you know oh you're always looking for the best of everything and when something like that happens it really kind of wakes you up to like oh wait a second I'm this is I mean it sounds ridiculous but like this is real so you did know, you I'm, really I, I, feel I mean, like what percentage of you every day on set was thinking I I could this I could be in trouble here were you always was it always in the back of your head um, I felt. I was safe on set. I was safe when I, like, once I left the hotel room with those guys, with with, with the three armed security, you know, uh, like ex-military guys. Um, I mean, I was safe. Um, but on the weekends, like the two days that you'd have off, you don't leave the hotel. And if you do, you have to call and the three guys show up and they go with you. What were their names? I don't, I don't remember their exact names. Johan. And they Johannes. and they rotate out, but they're they're also the same guys who go into the safari or into the um reserves and protect rhinos. Jeez. And, and, and I mean they real men. Are, real men is the word. They're real men. Real live or die situations for sure. Like you and I like to joke around a lot. There's some things they didn't want to joke around about. Like I'm like, <laughs> you know what? Like I'd be driving home like I don't know, Friday night at nine o'clock, whatever. And they're like, do you have any plans for the weekend? Because they want to know if they need to be there to go with me. And I'm like, no, I think I'm just going to go for a jog, you know, at night at like 2 a.m. <laughs> see how far I can go. And they were like, don't joke about that. Like they didn't. That's not funny. Fun. What? A- <laughs> I just love watching your face tell the story. You're almost reminiscing and going, oh, did you, how much did you miss? Like, honestly, were you like, heartbroken that you missed thompson and jess that much yeah it was there were a couple days where they were much tougher i mean every day i obviously missed them but there were a couple days were really tough um you know thompson was really small um so i kind of convinced myself that you know he didn't know i wasn't there and what he really needed was his mom but you know his mom my wife she you know obviously you know we just tried we did the best we could and she's a champ and she she's on board. She's a roll dog with like understanding that it was the job and stuff. Um, but ultimately, we were able to. She was able to get out to New York and be with my sister and her husband and their family and my parents, and that helped out a lot. You know, just cause, yeah. You know, otherwise she was just alone, a new mom with a little baby, and so she's a real champ through that. Um, but yeah, I don't I don't want to do that again. Inside of you is brought to you by Geico. What would you do without Geico? Well, you'd be uninsured. That would suck. Yeah, it would suck. I know friends that are uninsured. But if you're going to get an insurance policy, you want something that everybody knows, Mm -hmm. that you're aware of it, Mm -hmm. and certainly Geico is that. And they not only provide uh, insurance for maybe one thing, but insurance for many things. It's called a bundle, perhaps. Well, instead of getting, you know, uh, just homeowner's insurance with a company, and then, oh, then I have to get an auto insurance with it. Why wouldn't you just go to GEICO? Building policies with GEICO. GEICO makes it easy to bundle your homeowner's or renter's insurance along with your auto policy, and it's a good thing because you already have so much to do around your home. Just go to GEICO.com. Get a quote. See how much you could save. It's GEICO easy. Visit GEICO.com today. That's GEICO. Dot com. Inside of you is brought to you by Met Pro. Ryan, mm. do you want to improve your health? Sure do. You don't know where to start, do you? Nah. 
I had a feeling you'd say that. There's thousands of health strategies available. Now, the problem is when you see all these things, what do you, I'm like a guy in a, in a uh, ice cream store. I want ice, I want chocolate or vanilla, but there's strawberry shortcake chocolate trail mix. It's too much. <laughs> and I don't know what to do. So identifying which way to go, which one works for you or your body, yeah. it's, it's difficult. Yeah. It is. According to MetPro, the key to seeing results Get this, the key to seeing results is to master your metabolism. At MetPro, your metabolism isn't some mystery, it's a data point. Armed with hard science, MetPro is your health concierge delivering one-on-one -on -one coaching and personalized nutrition and fitness regimens. It's not just about weight loss. MetPro's coaches provide busy professionals, athletes, weekend warriors, and everyone in between with the support and education they need to live a healthier life, and God knows, I need that. Through their signature concierge coaching, this evaluation-based approach has allowed Poli and his highly respected team to transform thousands of lives from Olympic athletes and NFL MVPs to celebrities and the most influential business leaders in the world. Backed by data and driven by strategy, MetPro's team of industry-leading experts are challenging generalized health guidance by teaching people how to optimally manage their weight and achieve their associated performance goals. And recently, MetPro has launched a new tool that allows individuals to experience the same science and tailored strategy that their experts use. Folks, if you're looking for a high-touch experience, working with a metabolic expert, or if you want access to the tools their industry-leading coaches use, visit metpro.co slash inside to take their assessment and speak with their team to learn which option is best for you. Remember, visit metpro m e t p r o dot c o slash inside not com dot co metpro dot c o slash inside inside of you is brought to you by the apology line wondery's new true crime podcast the apology line begins with alan bridge posting flyers around new york city asking people to anonymously apologize for their crimes not to god not to the police, but to his answering machine. Within hours, the calls start coming in, people apologizing for stealing, infidelity, lying, and even murder. Alan got dozens of calls from people claiming to be murderers, but one stood out. Richie. He was deliberate, measured, and his calls would leave thousands wondering if he really was the serial killer he claimed to be. That is until Richie offered to provide proof of his crimes. Unable to just listen anymore, Alan knew he had to try and stop him. If you're listening to the audio version of this show, stick around to the end to hear a preview of the apology line. Or you can listen right now on Apple Podcasts. You know, we, we were talking a little bit about conventions earlier. And, uh, you know, since you started going and... Uh, I know you say, oh, yeah, well, I got you going. And, and, I, and I, I do take credit for that. But I, I, I do. But I also, I'm so happy you're doing them because together, it's, it's really fun. It's really fun. And people like yeah. seeing us together. And, you know, when this ends, we've got some big uh, conventions planned. And we do this thing called Smallville Nights, guys. I don't know if you've heard of it. But it's like, you know, it's, it's behind the scenes. It's tickets late night you know, after the convention's over. And Tom and I kind of walk through the uh, walk, the uh, people who are there, the guests, sort of, you know, our time in Smallville in a short way. And then we start to read scenes, but we, we do it in a special way. And, you know, no one can film it. No one can. It's just an intimate evening with us, kind of like uh, an improv night in a way. And people read scenes with us and some guy gets a bald cap and, you know, and, and, and so we're going and it's just such a fun like we were both kind of like, is this going to be fun? And once we did it, we do it for like an hour, hour and a half. Yeah, I mean, the way, the way, I mean, I, I chuckle just thinking about it because, and, and we all like, the reason we don't allow cameras or video tips is because it allows you and I to really let loose, especially me. Right. Like that it's really important for me because I have a tendency to be a little wary, but um, I don't know about you, but like there's maybe three times a year that I laugh so hard that I can't breathe. 
But every time we do small little nights, I, I, that happens like multiple times. Like you and I laugh like yeah. to the point we can't talk. It's just me with a Lana wig and hair in my face and like reading that scene in small from the pilot. And then I won't tell you everything that goes on in there, but if you guys ever have a chance and you're a Smallville fan or whatever, or you just want to come out and have a good time, the Smallville nights, if you see any, us at a convention, we're, we're actually going to La Mole. Well, well, Tom, you're going to La Mole. I wasn't invited, but I'm still going to go. Yeah, in Mexico, you should go. Yeah. Well, you invited yeah. me. That's so be in August, but that's going to be that's going to be probably our biggest ever. I think we have, yeah, we have yeah. access to a whole like convention space of, yeah it's, i think it's gonna be like a thousand people well we'd like to do a big one and uh you know hopefully i'll go it looks like i'll i'll, I'll go we're trying to work that out but uh tom and Kristen will be there and we, we'll, we'll do a small little nights in mexico and i'll tell you when i was there it was right at the beginning of the pandemic i'll never forget where i was at the beginning of the pandemic and that was me asking to fly home a, a, a day early to get back to LA because they were cl- going to close stuff in the airports and whatever. Me and Dolph. Yep. Me and Dolph Lundgren flew back and that was it. We had to go back. And I remember, but the people in Mexico, even though we couldn't like touch them at that point, it was just the beginning. We couldn't hug. And it was hard for us. Cause we're like, we like, Hey, give a hug. Talk. Uh, they were so amazing there. Uh, I, I just love the country. I love the people. And uh, I, I would be happy as shit to go back. Yeah, I mean, they're all the conventions are fun. I'm gonna get you wrong, but like that was such a big welcome. Like it was. Oh man, it felt so right? good. And, and it was scary because everybody knew. Every it was just the it was like literally if it was the weekend after it wouldn't have happened because of COVID. Oh yeah, like literally if it had been one week later it wouldn't have happened. And thankfully. I don't know anyone who got sick there, so that was really good. All right, this is shit talking. Uh, these are patrons of mine. They ask questions. If you if you want to join Patreon, I always message you right when you join, and it's a, a great fun group. It's patreon.com slash inside, and uh, it's brought to you by... I'm just kidding. <laughs> Michelle K., I would love to know if there are any good pranks Tom ever pulled on the Small World cast or it pulled on him. Uh, now, can you think of one that you haven't told? I it literally, I just looked out the window. I'm like, what have I not told? I mean, we would always like be, be like poking at each other, but not ever at the sake of of performance. I mean, there's the one. Well, we did have you dress up in the green screen, uh, skin tight leotard once. Oh we god, was I was so pissed. I was hanging like up there in this green leotard and a green screen blending in yeah. with the wall, and you're like, oh, just a little more. Can you make a face like this? Arr! I'm like, why would I do that? Why? And I'm doing all these stupid things, and they're just laughing their ass up behind the camera. I could have been home two hours ago, and they were just fucking with me. The, uh, I, I think, think <laughs> I think it was you one time. I had a tra- my trailer Glenn, again because Glenn was in on the jokes. Glenn, Glenn yeah, but I had a big trailer, you know, whatever. And I thought it was you who one day I walk and the the AD goes, "Oh, Michael, no, your trailer's over here." And I go, "Uh, where?" And it was like this three banger. So three, three rooms in a row, like the size of like One. a small shitter. And I go, w- w- where? He's like, oh, that, that's your trailer today. I'm like, why? He's like, oh, I don't, I don't know. They just, that, that's your trailer. I'm like, what the fuck? And I went up to, I went upstairs to the production office. I go, Bob. And he, d- he couldn't even get one line out instead of going yeah he immediately started laughing he goes <laughs> i go you fuck he goes i'm sorry i couldn't even keep up we're gonna try to keep that joke going for a while i mean it was the smallest trailer ever i mean i had my little gym in there and i was trying to i mean this anyway i thought it was you i thought well, we, we had I, it wasn't it wasn't with you but we had this uh we had this new this brand new ad guy <laughs> and if you guys don't know who ad's i it, it's basically the person who's the least has the least experience ever. They're the ones that are that are given the responsibility to knock on the doc, the actor's trailer and say we're ready, and then follow them or lead them to set. Third ads or tads, they're called. Tads, even yeah, tads, tads more like yeah. Tad. And we had this guy, and it was his. I think it was his second day, and I don't think you were part of this, but me and Steve Oben, the wardrobe guy. I'm like Steve, give me a radio. And by the way, you never give. You never give an actor a radio. Like that's just oh, like, dude, I you love get it. fired if you give an actor a radio because actors are not responsible. Yeah, because I'm the one. Hey, Tom, I'm the asshole who goes, uh, everybody's gonna take a two hour lunch today. So <laughs> exactly. enjoy that. I'm the right. actor guy. I'm the asshole. Go ahead. Right. And then everybody goes, Who gave him the radio? And then that person gets fired. Great. So I said to, so I said to Steve, I go, come on, give me, give me a radio. He goes, 
I'm not going to give you my radio, but if you took it off my belt, then I couldn't do anything about it. <laughs> oh, yeah. I was like, all right, so I took it off his belt. I think it was, G- I, maybe it was Jimmy, but I was, anyway, I'm like, uh, Jimmy, come in. And he's like, uh, Jimmy here. I'm like, uh, Jimmy, uh, can you meet Tom Welling outside of his trailer? Yep, on the way. Jimmy's there. Uh, Jimmy, are you outside Tom's trailer? Yep, I'm right here. Uh, Tom's saying that you're not there. And we're looking like from like, you know, you're just fucking with this poor guy. And he's standing outside the trailer. And we're like, uh, Tom's on his cell phone saying that he's outside of his trailer <laughs> and he doesn't see you. He's he's threatening to go home. And this poor kid is going like his physical his, his physicality is like <laughs> just fuck. I'm in front of his trailer and he's losing his mind. Oh right? my god. And then finally, like it ended up being like 15 people stepping out laughing and the kid was like oh. but it was also sort of like a welcome <laughs> it, to the it's funny as long as he doesn't get fired all right here we go rapid fire leanne p what's something that people don't know about rosie leanne what do you not know about me oh. or they don't know people don't know about me i don't know i mean i think people know a lot of stuff about you um i think you well this isn't very rapid fire is go it? ahead give it give it shoot it um do it do it do it, do it. i don't I, I don't know. There, there's such there's, there's 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 like an adventurous spirit about you that I don't think you follow enough out physically out in the world. Like I think you want to travel and I think you want to see the world. Like, but I don't see you like doing it. There's like a fear, isn't there? For some reason, like I you feel don't like, like go on vacations. Like you don't like go out and do things for yourself. <sighs> You know what it is? I bet it has something. Do you ever see that commercial where these this couple, they go to a castle, and the guy's got explosive diarrhea, and and the the tour guide or whatever is like, this castle once had twenty eight bathrooms, and the guy's like, if it only had one now, <laughs> and I'm thinking I'm gonna be uncomfortable. Uh, you know, you got, I got to wake up early to go look at shit. I want to sleep. I'm gonna be a bummer for the other person. I just, all these things come, it's always fear with me. You're right. You fucking know me. Sorry for the F-bomb. Dave P, rapid fire. Do you feel closure on your Smallville character after the return of the Infinite Earths crossover? I felt closure on my character when we finished Smallville. I thought the, uh, the Infinite um, opportunity was was just icing on the cake. Good um, answer. Yeah. Nico P, does it still irk you when people refer to you as Superman instead of Clark Kent? It used to, not so much anymore. Hmm. Jack Slater. But, by the way, poor me. Right? Yeah, poor I, you. Hey, Superman! Oh, now I'm like, I've been called worse. That's sort of my, my comeback. Oh, yeah, you have been. Jack asks, if you didn't become an actor, what do you think you'd be doing? Let me see if I can guess this. If you didn't become an actor, I, I, just, part of me wanted to say teacher, but uh, you know, I don't know. Nah. I think I would be like a forest. I'd be like in the forest fire service or something like out something. I could see that. Like, yeah. And then you get cast. They go, who's that firefighter at that one? Let's, <laughs> let's get him as a role. Yeah. By the, by the way, like that, that's the funny thing. Like imagine if like, I never got cast as a, like a forest fire, like that. All I wanted in life was to be a forest fire. And I can't even get that role. Marissa. And I loved your portrayal, by the way, congratulations, Marissa. Just say congratulations, Marissa. Congratulations. Marissa. She's graduating. She's awesome. Oh, I really? loved your portrayal of Kane on Lucifer. What were some of your favorite moments working on the show and with the cast? Um, well, all of them, actually. But um, it was really fun when I got to work with Tom and Lauren together because their back and forth was so great. And they were so welcoming to allow me to be a part of it. Um, they were just, they're, they're like, they're extremely prepared. Um, but at the same time, they want to have fun with what they're doing and get it done at the same time, which reminded me of kind of what we did in a way of Smallville. Um, but what a warm cast. I mean, uh, I've never, I had never really been on a show where I was like the guy who was going to be there every couple episodes. And they were just like, hey, man, what's up? You know, like, let's go. Do you have their phone numbers? Do you talk to them ever? Yeah, Lauren and uh, my wife have become great friends. Um, and then Tom's a great dude and he's always there. Um, yeah, they're just, so you could get them on the show. Probably you could probably spread the word, right? Oh, I would reach out for sure. If you, if you, you'd have to ask. Well, all the patrons and listeners have been going, 
Lucifer, Lucifer, get those oh, actors yeah. on. They're all dying for I'd, those guys. I'd, I'd be happy to reach out. Ah, for them. well, reach out and touch. Claudine you Newman. And Lauren, you and Lauren would get along great, especially. Well, tell her that. That'd be awesome. Claudine, then, what has been your proudest moment as a father so far? I mean, every second, every second, especially when he runs and puts his arms out and says, Dada. Um, it's every second. I mean, I was thinking the other day that we were doing, we were going to do this podcast and like, you don't know until you have a child and people who have children know this and someone like you who doesn't has to listen to people say this, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's, there's nothing like it. That's all you can say. Ryan, do you want to be a father? Yeah, I do. Tom, what would you give advice to Ryan or anybody out there about being a father? What's the one thing you got to let go or one thing you just, you really need to know now that you're a father in the moment? Well, there's a, there's a funny thing where <clears throat> when we realized that we, you know, we were pregnant and one of my good friends said, ha, 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 and I was like, why are you laughing? And he's like, it's not about you anymore. And I was like, yeah, I know that. Like, I know it's not about me. But then when the baby arrives, it still took a couple of months for me to like, there's a whole nother phase of like, oh, I see it. Like nothing is about me anymore. Like that. Like you're a part of it, but it's a whole nother like thing in your in your body that you feel. But it's the most rewarding thing you can ever do in the same in the same breath. You know, I will say this, and I and I have no resentment or regrets, or you know, life is life. You know, deals the cards, and yeah. you take them, and 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 you know. You could respond or react how you want. You could blame. You could do this. I love my mother. I love my father. I've talked about that. But I think that was a problem. My mom got pregnant so early and she was so young and she hadn't got to do, uh, she hadn't, she, she didn't do the things she wanted to do right away. And I think that she, even though she loved us and did the best she could, so I don't blame her, she, she still wanted to be the center of attention. And that I think that that affected us greatly, or it, it, it certainly affected us a lot. Because well, and, and you and have to, you have that. to let go of that. You have to, as a father, if I ever have a just child, I have to be. You have to be like you cannot be selfish. The kid comes first. Period. There, well, there's a term called a wonderful burden, that 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 could have been the case, and I think parents like that could happen to anybody. Where like you have a child, and it's it could be a wonderful burden, you know, like because of your situation or, you know, maybe your mom was juggling so many things at that time. Man, you know, this, man. This, I mean, listen, this is like, <laughs> just kidding. you go down this road forever, but, um, but I, but I think that's, yeah. I mean, your mom, I, from your stories, you tell me, I mean, your, your mom likes to be. Yeah. yeah well, look, uh, and so do I. So I get that it trickled down. I have to be the center of attention, but I'm saying, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm saying, fuck it. <laughs> Kelly, Kel, ask two questions, then we're done, buddy. You're out of it. Kelly, yes. After 20 years of bromance with Michael, have you ever had a fight? No. Remember that there was just that one time where I got mad, but you were just joking when I was directing an episode. Oh, but that's not a fight. Yeah, that was just you fucking with me. No, we don't really fight. Guy. We so we we know the thing is is like sometimes he'll tell me it's like, dude. Blah, blah, blah. This is what has to get done. I'm like, oh. Or I'll go, dude, just remember. I guess, ah, you're right. Let's go. We we yeah, do that. I, there, there, you know, there's very few people in my life, I don't know about you, that I have the relationship with you where I just, I don't have to question your motives. No. Like, I really, I've never had to question them. And I don't know how we ever really established that. We just, like, it. I can't imagine, like, we've been at conventions where, like, we're both going in different directions and one needs something. It's like, okay, let's go. Let's That's it. it. It's like Michael yeah. Jordan, Scotty Pippen, and I don't know who's who, but it's just like I'm in. Like we already know, like we're teammates. Like that's it. We're, in, we're you know, friends. Yeah, I agree, hundred percent. You know, and I have to say, it's like I wouldn't say, you know, I have I have close friends, but you know, if someone needs me, or you know, I remember when you went to the hospital, I fucking I didn't think about should I go. It was just there's certain people where I'm like I'm going to the hospital right now. Right. You know what right. I mean? There's like, that's how it's going to be. And that was a while ago. So don't think he just went to the fucking hospital. Like, what, <gasps> what happened? What happened? Little Lisa, last one. What's in your bucket list for 2021? I mean, I want to continue uh, growing my family, but I, I want to get back to work, man. Like it's in a situation where I feel like I could, where everyone's safe. I want to work. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm reading a lot of scripts. There's, I have a lot of opportunities out there that, 
more than I've probably ever had before. It's just a matter of figuring out which one is a safe environment and a safe place because we're all trying to do that in our own lives as well. Can we try to do something together? I know we've talked about it. We could do something just creatively and not worry about whether it's a huge success. We could just do it to have fun. And if it's successful, great. I think we should definitely, there's certain people in my life where I'm like, I just want to do something with them. Well, I mean, I think we briefly talked about this a couple months ago, but you know, let's come on up here where I am, where we can just shoot on my property and we can climb mountains and like do something fun. Exactly. Like, you know, I don't, I don't think you need a permit to film on your own property. No. Do you? Maybe insurance. By the way, Jordan Jonas, the winner of season uh, uh, alone, season six, remember he's a buddy now and he's going to take us because he won. He knows how to survival skills. So you're going to go with me. Pat Alecki's going to go. Chris Daughtry name dropping. And a couple of my friends who are just been my friends for life who are not in the industry, like Lally and and maybe uh, my my friend Ballard. And uh, you think my I guess is picture bad. Jared carrying Lally up the mountain or something. He'll carry me. I'm I'm telling you, I'm 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 so scared of like after this, you're gonna be like Rosenbaum is just such an idiot. I always have this fear that I'm just gonna like you guys are lighting fires and I'm like sneaking in a lighter and like you know and like you guys are frying fish and I've got like fish sticks from like more you know Gordon's fish sticks. And like, I can't do anything. And I'm just well, like, that's fine. why we have to do it. That's why we have to do it. Survival. Remember, you can't be creative if you're in survival mode, guys. You can't be in creative mode if you're in survival mode. That's that's my that's I hope. I mean, it's just something to, to when you think about it, you can feel it. Um, and you can like. I don't know what I'm even when I feel like I'm in survival mode, I'm, I'm like, even like, how can I be creative? in my survival mode somehow, or how can I just yeah. step back for a second and look at options? Because in survival mode, you have a tendency to get, you know, narrow minded yeah. and, and lose foresight. But if you have the ability to just kind of step back for a second, I mean, you're really good at this. I've seen you do this and um, just sort of seeing the big picture. Yeah. Well, dude, look, man, I love you like a brother and You've always been so supportive, man. You wear my left and Laurel hat. You listen to the album. I remember going, oh, my God, I sold 20 things. The band we sold. And I'm like, oh, it's all from Welling. Welling by I, well, yeah, I love those hats. They on fit the, my head. Inside of you online store. Well, I will send you more stuff, man. I always send you shit. Yeah, you know what I really love is when you ride up to, well, what used to be my house in those scooters, those badass scooters you have. Um, what are those, the, the fat ones, the fat scooters. Fat scooters, yeah. yeah. Those are dope. Well, maybe oh, I can talk to the guys about getting you on. Maybe if you make I a need video. Off road tires and like make sure they can, you know, the suspension can carry me. But yeah. Yeah, they are, they are badass. I love them. They they designed one of the, my one of my favorite movies, The Warriors, the old gang movie. So they decked it out Warriors. They did an inside of you one for the podcast. Those Do guys are great. Yeah. 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 They're, they're Drew and Peter, they take care of us. And in fact, you know, I, I work, you know, I do stuff with the Ronald McDonald house and my buddy, um, Preston, they, they go, Hey, can we give Preston a scooter? I'm like, yeah, oh, they're just, I mean, they're just good dudes and it's a good company. Fat scooters, man. I love those guys there. And yeah, we'll get you one, but Hey guys, uh, this is Tom Welling. <laughs> All right, dude, you're awesome. That was incredible. All right. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> thanks. Thanks. Really for... All right. Later, buddy. I love thanks. you, man. See you. I love the guy. He's a brother to me. Welling's a brother. He'll always be a brother. Um, you know, I always appreciate Tom coming back to the show. And uh, he wears his Left on Laurel hat and his Inside of You hat. I'm not with Left on Laurel. I'll have to wear a Sunspin hat now. Yeah, that's true. But same thing with uh, Stephen Amell. Always wears the Inside of You hat and supported the band. And um, I, I, it's just nice. People don't have to do that. And they do it. And, you know, they do it because either the hat fits really nicely and looks really good on them. Or they want to support me or both. or they couldn't find another hat. Thanks to everybody again for listening and all my patrons. I like the video thing we did, patrons. So I'm going to do that again where you guys ask questions on video and I respond to them on video. It's a little thing, guys, inside of me. And when you're a patron, if you go to Patreon, P A T R E O N dot com slash inside of you, you join, you support the podcast, and there's tears and there's lots of fun. And uh, I might even do an, an, another uh, YouTube live with just the patrons this weekend. So I'll let you guys know. And don't forget the Inside You online store. Everything's 15% off with the code Happy New Year 21. Will you remind me, Ryan? You didn't remind me last time. Happy New Year 21. Yeah, I mean, after the show. Yeah. I didn't need to be reminded. <laughs> uh, what's, what's the problem? Uh, thank you. Please write a review. Go to, go to Apple Podcasts. Write the review. Um, tell them you love it. Whatever you want to do. 
And thanks what Westwood won. Thank you, Ryan, uh, of course, for always giving badass episodes. Thanks, Bryce, for being my uh, right hand man when it comes to doing social and everything really helps me out. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, to my grandmother who unconditionally loves me and tells me every day. And uh, that certainly means a lot. By the way, uh, write me in. Tell me what you think of having my grandma Blanche on the podcast. Would anybody watch? I'm going to do it. But would you like to see her? She's a sweet, sweet woman. And it will just uh, make your heart feel nice and gooey. Let's read the patrons. Want to do that? Sure. Here we go. These are all uh, lovely people. And I know uh, just about all of them. I know all of them. And that's what's great about Patreon. You get to know people. Nancy D, thanks for the pillows. Leah S, thanks for the pillows. Trisha F, Sarah V, Little Lisa, Yukiko, Jill E, Brian H, Hidden Kim, Lauren G, Nico, Robin S, Jerry Wood, Emily K. We got Robert I, we got Jason W, Stephen J, Kristen K, not to be confused with. Kristen Crook. Amelia O, Allison L, Jess J, Lucas M, Raj C, Joshua D, Emily S, CJ. P. That's correct. Samantha M. Gosh, you're good. I wouldn't get these. Yeah, I would. <laughs> Jennifer N, Jackie P, Stacy L, Carly H, Jennifer S, Janelle B, Carrie B, Ashley K, Kimberly E, Crystal H, Mike E, Marissa N, Danielle P, Jack uh, S. Yes, Jack S. <laughs> Jack Slater. I love my Jack. Ra Mira. Ramira. That's right. Beth B, Santiago. N N M. M. Good close. Sarah F, Chad W, Leanne. P. Correct. Ro v wade roshan <laughs> roshan r roshan ray a maya p maddie s tiffany i kendrick f ashley e shannon d matt w belinda n kevin v james r chris h anusha w Osborne. Osborne h gabby m amy c dave h samantha s spider-man chase sheila g ray h Alyssa c tab of the t misha h deb a tom and natalie 622 not to be confused with natalie 623 Suzanne B, Henry S, Katie F, Liliana A, Michelle K, Hannah B, Michelle S, Talia M, Lucas H, John S, Andrew T, Christy S, Claire M, Liz J, Laura L. You know which one we're missing? Yukiko. Maybe she, no, we got Yukiko. Oh. But I think uh, maybe someone left the patron. Could break my heart. Oh, no. Tabitha272, not to be confused with. Tabitha273. Well, Tabitha, thank you for all your support. If you're not here with us, I just would like to give a special shout out to you. Um, and the winners. Of the last stage it, we got Ray. Ray, I love you. It was so great talking to you in Australia. Um, Gracie, I, I love you. And thanks for supporting. Uh, we, we do these stages, folks. And they uh, you, you win prizes and there's Zooms. And uh, Gracie won the early show. And Ray won. Ray Harada. Ray Harada won the uh, other show. Great prizes and new sunspin pictures and it means a lot to me that you guys keep coming. I, I want to do these shows forever. I almost want to just do the, it's weird. I kind of want to just do the podcast and Patreon mm -hmm. and do my music and stage it's and it'd be nice. I mean, it's a blessing to be able to do all these things. I love you guys. Thank you for allowing me to be inside of you uh, from my house in undisclosed location. Yeah. In the hills. Uh, Ryan, thank you. Thank you. Let's wave goodbye. Bye. See you guys. Thank you. Bye.